<laughs> the next item of business is debate on motion 15032 in the name of Michael Russell on protecting our interests, Scotland's response to the UK government and EU's withdrawal agreement and political declaration. May I ask those who wish to contribute to the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Michael Russell to speak to and move the motion. Eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me at the outset make it clear that in keeping with the vote of the people of Scotland of 23 June 2016, the Scottish Government regards membership of the EU as the best outcome of the current chaos and moreover believes that that aim is still achievable. Nonetheless, when I addressed Parliament on the 25th of October, I committed to bringing any EU withdrawal deal and political declaration when agreed by the UK Government to this Parliament before it was voted on in the House of Commons. I am pleased to do so today with a motion which is the result of a unique collaboration between four of the five parties in this Parliament. If it is passed, Scotland will say that it rejects both the Prime Minister's deal and no deal, and instead looks to its politicians to find a better way forward. It is important that those politicians, including ourselves, do not let the people down. Of course, there are various options which could provide, if I could make some progress, of course, there are various options which could provide a long-term solution to the problem of Brexit, a problem that is absorbing huge amounts of time and effort and is worrying and upsetting so many of our fellow citizens. Staying in the EU might be achieved by providing the opportunity for a second vote, as strongly backed in this Parliament by the Liberal Democrats and supported by ourselves and the Greens. However, short of staying, the only acceptable compromise which the Scottish Government has advocated for two years is continued membership of the single market and the customs union. Others, primarily in the Labour Party, have argued for a general election as the best way to resolve the issue. That option would also be supported by the SNP in a vote at Westminster. In fact, the only option that does not provide a solution to the current chaos of Brexit is that proposed by the Prime Minister. Let me outline some of the many problems with this deal and let me do so by trying to bring home the effects of this proposal to members sitting on the Tory benches. Let me start with the Highlands and Islands, part of which I represent, no, no allow me to make some progress, part of which I represent and the region for which Mr Cameron is a list member. Indeed, he was the Conservative candidate for my constituency of Argyll and Butte at the last election. The population of Argyll and Butte and of the Highlands is not growing naturally. We are, to put it bluntly, not reproducing ourselves. We need migration, even to remain static. A fifth of the working age population of the area will retire in the next five to ten years. We need to replace them, for if we don't, there will be continued depopulation and accelerating economic decline. The only way we can do so is by migration. And the best solution is freedom of movement, which allows easy passage and great flexibility. Business in my constituency tells me that all the time. But the Prime Minister has set her face against such a solution with strident and deeply regrettable language. So unless this deal is rejected, the area I represent, which Mr Cameron has sought to represent as a constituency member, and may again, will be severely and permanently damaged. Is he going to vote for that? But rural areas will be hit, of course. Murdo Fraser. I'm grateful to Mr Russell for giving way. He just mentioned what business wants. Every leading business organisation in Scotland, the CBI, the Chambers of Commerce, yeah. the National Farmers Union of Scotland, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, the Scottish Whiskey Association, yeah. leading figures like Sir Ian Wood are urging this government and politicians of Westminster to back the Prime Minister's deal. Yeah. Shouldn't he listen to business? Michael Russell. Not entirely accurate. For example, the CBI's head of EU negotiations, Nicholas Sykes, argued there's no need to give credit to negotiators because it's not a good deal. That's the CBI view of the deal. And of course, there are fishermen the length and breadth of Scotland, including in my own constituency, and I uh, declare an interest as the president of the honorary president of the Scottish Creole Fishermen's Association, who say this is not a deal that should be backed. But let me continue, because I shall come to the issue of certainty, which is what business want, in a moment. So unless this deal is rejected, the area, uh, rural areas will be hit in other ways too. The guarantees for agricultural funding run only until 2022. The failure of the UK to agree on the agricultural bill makes it even more urgent for us to legislate here. And for fisheries, the message is even starker. The Tories have sold out Scottish fishing yet again, linking it to trade and agreeing to build any new settlement on the existing access and quotas. The deal says so. 
despite the increasingly desperate assertions from Mr. Carlow last week, egged on by Northeast MSPs on either side of him. So are Mr. Chapman and Mr. Burnett going to vote for that? Our cities also benefit greatly from EU funding. There's been, for example, money from the European Social Fund, which has in part helped unemployed people gain qualifications and find jobs. Money from the European Regional Development Fund has also helped accelerate the growth of Glasgow's small and medium-sized enterprises, and EU green infrastructure funding has helped the environment. Not a single promise has yet been made about replacing all those much-needed sums of money in Glasgow. So is Mr. Tompkins really going to vote to impoverish the city he represents? and vote for decline in the university sector, which he also knows well. And, presiding officer, the EU is the largest single market for Scotland's international exports, worth 12.7 billion in 2016, supporting directly and indirectly hundreds of thousands of jobs across Scotland. And in 2015, Scotland exported around 3.6 billion worth of goods to countries with which the EU has a free trade agreement. Those exports make the difference between success and failure for businesses large and small, Businesses like those who employ many in constituencies like, say, Eastwood. So is Mr. Carlaw going to vote against his own constituents' employment and prosperity? Presiding officer, there is, to put it bluntly but accurately, no free trade agreement in the world which provides anything close to the freedom of movement for services as presently exists for Scotland within the European single market. Services cover many sectors. But of course, Edinburgh is particularly dependent on financial and legal services which fuel the economy of the city. Members for Edinburgh know that well, including the leader of the Scottish Conservatives. Yet this deal from the Prime Minister will make it considerably harder for Edinburgh companies to trade in services with Europe. Why would the party led by Ruth Davidson vote in favour of that? Presiding, Scotland in every, presiding officer, in every area of Scotland, there are businesses, organisations, communities and individuals who will suffer, directly suffer, over a long period of time if this deal is approved. Each and every person will suffer. The analysis we have done indicates that by 2030, if after leaving the EU we move to a free trade agreement, GDP will be cut by £9 billion, equivalent to £1,600 per person in Scotland. So forget £350 million a week more for the NHS. The reality is £30 a week less for every man, woman and child, with no respite. And, presiding officer, this deal is not even the end of uncertainty. That's just another false promise. In fact, the uncertainty flowing from the Prime Minister's deal would have to last until the end of the transition period, which will not be in December 2020. No one believes that. More likely in December 2022 or even later. That's at least four years of uncertainty to add to the two and a half we've already had. Four more years of stagnation and lack of investment, with no guarantee that a free trade deal will ever be struck. Those are the fruits of conservative government. More of the same and worse. More meaningless assertions, false claims, cliff-edge negotiations, and economic lack of confidence and security. It mustn't happen. Scotland needs and deserves better than the Prime Minister's blindfold Brexit. For in truth, presiding officers, this deal is about saving the Prime Minister, not about saving her country. It's a matter of fact there is no certainty in the Prime Minister's deal on the future trading arrangements, neither for goods nor for services. There is no possibility of much-needed flexible future mobility arrangements. There is no clarity on which, if any, of the existing justice and law enforcement tools and measures may remain available. There's no guarantee of continued participation in that broad range of EU programmes and funds which support our universities, communities, NGOs and businesses. The Scottish Government has recognised the danger inherent in this, but there is one silver lining. It doesn't have to be like that. Let me repeat this fact. The choice is not between May's deal and no deal. Yesterday's opinion from the Advocate General demonstrated that. The vote by MSPs, con MPs confirmed it. Reasonable people are now moving to make sure that a better way is found. Last night, the Welsh Assembly voted decisively to reject the Prime Minister's deal, with revealingly the only votes against coming from the Tories and UKIP, a party now so far to the right that even Nigel Farage has had to resign from it. This chamber can contribute to and move on that process by voting for that motion in my name, Mr Finlay's name, Mr Greer's and Mr Scott's name today. I commend that action and that motion to the Parliament.
call Adam Tompkins. Eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's two and a half years since the British people voted to leave the European Union. And in all that time, only one credible proposal has been tabled as to how we leave and as to the detailed terms on which we leave. And that proposal, that proposal of course, is the 585-page withdrawal agreement that the Prime Minister and her team have painstakingly negotiated over the last 20 years. And in analysing that deal, two simple legal facts must be borne in mind. First, under the terms of Article 50, if no exit deal is agreed between the UK and the European Union, we will crash out of the European Union on a no-deal basis. Yeah. And second, exit day is fixed in law as the 29th of March 2019. So the reality, presiding officer, whether we like it or not, is that the country is rapidly approaching that point where it faces a clear binary choice. Either we leave the European Union on the basis of the orderly withdrawal agreement that the Prime Minister and her team have negotiated, or something very close to it, or we crash out of the European Union on a no-deal basis that would be a disaster for the economy. That's the reality. That's where we're heading. And those who would prefer to reject this deal must confront the plain legal fact that their actions serve only to make it more likely that we end up crashing out of the European Union on a no-deal basis. Now, now, there continues to be... Uh, you're making my point for me, Mr Finlay. Now, there continues to be a great deal of noise around this. There should um, be a people's excuse vote. Excuse me, Mr Tomkins. Article 50. Excuse me, Mr Tomkins. Could we do Mr Tomkins the courtesy of listening without shouting at him, please? Thank you, Mr Tomkins. There continues to be a great deal of noise about this, presiding officer. There should be a people's vote. Article 50 should be delayed. We could stay in the single market and the customs union. We can be Norway. We can be Norway plus. We should have another general election. But so much of this is just noise, as is today's motion. We want a better alternative, says the motion, without any clue as to what that alternative might be or how it could possibly be delivered. We've had two and a half years since the referendum, presiding officer, and in all that time, no credible alternative to the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement has even got off the ground, never mind been made successfully to fly. So let's face facts. As things stand, the only credible choice before us is whether we leave on the basis of the Prime Minister's negotiated settlement or something very close to it, or whether we crash Mr. out Finley. without a deal at all. Presiding officer, we are leaving because that's what the British people told us they want. To take back control of our laws, our borders and our money. And that's exactly what the Prime Minister's deal Point delivers. Point of order, Neil Finlay. I wonder if you could confirm that there's plenty of time in this debate for members to take interventions. It is absolutely up to speakers whether they take interventions or not. It is also the case that I would prefer less disruption so that we could, in fact, listen to the speakers. Adam Tompkins, please continue. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To take back control of our laws, our borders and our money. And that's exactly what the Prime Minister's deal delivers. And if it turns out, Presiding Officer, that we, the Scottish Conservatives, are alone in standing up for the one million Scots who voted for that outcome, yeah. so be it. Ever since June 2016, Presiding Officer, Nicola Sturgeon's SNP have been trying to weaponise Brexit to suit their own nationalist agenda. They aren't interested in Brexit for its own sake. For them, it's just another tool in their endless pursuit of independence. And it seems today that they've hoodwinked Labour and the Liberal Democrats into supporting them in this endeavour. So if it turns out that we, the Scottish Conservatives, are alone in standing up for the two million Scots who in 2014 voted no, to breaking up the United Kingdom, so be it. Labour can't be trusted on the union and would rather get into bed with the nationalists as they do today. The Liberal Democrats cannot be Excuse trusted me, Mr. on the Tompkins. union and would rather get into bed with Mr. the nationalists Tompkins. as they do today. Please sit down, Mr Rennie. It is entirely up to the individual speaker whether or not they take interventions. If it is quite clear he's not taking interventions, please do not resort to shouting. Please just sit down. Thank you. Mr. Tom.
The Scottish Conservatives, Mr Rennie, will never cave in to the SNP. Not today, not now, not ever. Because unlike the SNP, we believe that the results of referendums must be respected. We voted to remain in the United Kingdom in 2014, and two years later, we voted as one United Kingdom to leave the European Union. And that's precisely what we will do. Presiding officer, among other notable matters, this deal withdraws the UK from the EU's hated common fisheries policy, which the SNP would drag Scotland back into in a heartbeat. Under this deal, we will become an independent coastal state with full control over our own waters. And the Prime Minister has been clear that under her leadership, this is something that will never be traded away against other priorities. And much has been said, presiding officer, about the unique position of Northern Ireland under this deal. We've just heard the Minister wrongly claim that the deal gives Northern Ireland a competitive advantage that Scottish business, um, and that Scottish business will suffer as a result. Wrong on both counts. Yes, the backstop does mean that Northern Ireland will be required to adhere to certain limited provisions of EU single market law as regards goods. But the Prime Minister's number two, David Liddington, told this Parliament on Thursday last week that if the backstop comes into force, that will be true for the whole of the UK and not only for Northern Ireland. So there is no competitive advantage for Northern Ireland and there is no disadvantage to Scottish business. Presiding officer, the SNP would have us believe that it is only the UK government who are saying it's this deal or no deal. But let us not be misled. It's the European Union itself who is saying this. For the EU, Britain's withdrawal is now a done deal. There's no appetite in Brussels or in any major European capital for this deal to be unpicked or renegotiated. On the continent, they've moved on. The concern in France and Germany is not Brexit, it's whether the Italians are about to crash the economy of the entire Eurozone. And when the Europeans do think about Brexit, they think about our future trading relationship, not the divorce agreement, which, as they see it, is done and dusted. Presiding officer, business backs this deal. NFU Scotland backs this deal. The Scotch Whiskey Association backs this deal. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce back this deal. Nicola Sturgeon and Mike Russell decided to ignore all of these voices and to condemn the Prime Minister's deal before they'd even seen it. But the time for nationalist game playing is over, presiding officer. As a country, we have a choice to make. Do we back the Prime Minister's carefully negotiated withdrawal agreement or do we crash out of the European Union on a no-deal basis? And my answer is simple. We should reject today's SNP motion. We should support the Prime Minister's efforts to secure an orderly, negotiated and agreed withdrawal from the European Union. I call Neil Finlay. Seven minutes, please. Thanks, President Officer. So much for the great constitutional lawyer. Afraid to take an intervention. <laughs> Afraid to take a single intervention from a bricklayer, a used car salesman, and a Liberal Democrat. How <laughs> timid is he? There you go. And let me tell you why he's so timid. Because this gets to the crux of the hypocrisy of the Tory party. Look at the legal advice that's just been released by the Attorney General. It states in paragraph 8, the GB is, GB is essentially treated as a third country by Northern Ireland for goods passing from GB to Northern Ireland, and later explains the different terms that will be in place between GB and Northern Ireland. And who wrote this? We would not support any deal that creates a border of any kind in the Irish Sea and undermines the Union or leads to Northern Ireland having a different relationship with the EU and the rest of the UK beyond which currently Point exists. of order, Gil Patterson. Let me tell you before that. Point Ruth of Davidson order, and David Gil Mundell Patterson. Said that. You can repeat that line when you get back on your feet, Mr Finlay, but currently it's a point of order, Gil Patterson. Just to correct the record, I don't sell cars. <laughs> OK. Neil Finlay. David Mundell and Ruth Davidson, that was their word. So that's why they're so embarrassed and won't take an intervention. And just in, in just a few months' time, the UK is poised to leave the EU in a 40-year-long economic 
and political relationship will come to an end. For businesses and consumers, workers, students and all our citizens, the overwhelming feeling is one of uncertainty. Businesses want to know how to plan ahead. Workers want to know their hard-won rights won't be sold down the river. The people in the island of Ireland, Ireland want to know they, will not, they won't now see a hard border and manufacturers want to know if they'll be able to access European markets. All of these groups have been left hanging by a government paralysed by a 40-year civil war over Europe. David Cameron, remember him? Called the referendum to try and bring to a head these historic divisions in his party and in doing so made the political miscalculation. A political miscalculation unprecedented in modern politics. One that risks a 9% decline in the UK economy, that threatens jobs or security or future international relationships with their near neighbours. And of course, it won't be Cameron whose livelihood will be threatened. He'll no, no doubt continue to relax, relax in sunny climes with his trotters up as chaos reigns. It won't be Cameron whose rights at work will be lost. It won't be Jacob Rees-Mogg who will not be able to afford the children's school fees or Boris de Feffel Johnson. He'll still rake it in from gullible newspaper editors paying him for writing his ill-informed drivel. For the establishment clique, life will go on almost untainted by the impact of their own ineptness. But for working people and the companies that employ them, these are uncertain times. On Tuesday, the future of our country will be determined. And one thing is clear. With 100 Tory backbenchers opposed, the Prime Minister's deal is indeed doomed. Certainly. <coughs> Patrick I'm, uh, Harvey. I'm grateful to Mr Finlay for giving way, and I agree with his analysis and his, his predictions of what will happen if Brexit goes ahead. What the people he's talking about genuinely need is the transformation of economic policy domestically. Does Mr Finlay agree that any Brexit, any Brexit, will make that transformation that's so needed harder, not easier, and should we not be standing up against Brexit in all its forms? Neil Let Finlay. Let me say to Patrick Harvey, I agree with him that what those people need is the transformation of the economy. And the biggest transformation that the economy will have is the election of a Labour government led by Jeremy Corbyn. The uh, Prime Minister's deal is doomed. Labour won't support it because the deal won't protect jobs. It won't ensure frictionless trade. It provides no certainty about our future relationship with the EU. It fails to deliver close cooperation. It rules out a permanent customs union. It fails to deliver a good deal in services and would limit access for British businesses to markets. It would weaken our international security and corporate cooperation and it undermines devolution and fails to deliver for all the nations and regions of the UK. And of course, it's not just us that oppose the deal. The Liberal, Liberal Democrats oppose it. The Green Party oppose it. SNP... Plaid Cymru and the DUP and around 10 Tory MSPs, if they were honest with themselves, all those who voted Leave oppose it to The PM has united Leavers and Remainers in opposition to it. The deal is doomed and will be rejected out of hand by the House of Commons. But let me be clear, when it's rejected, then that does not mean, does not mean we revert to no deal. That's the false choice being presented by the Prime Minister who's trying, trying to bail her out, with a, uh, out of as a combination. If you want to intervene, by all means, I'll take an intervention from you, Mr. Tompkins. Adam Tompkins. Will, will the member tell us what his alternative is then? Absolutely. Neil Absolutely Finley. we'll set out our alternative. Absolutely we will, Mr. Tompkins. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, you're, you, you have some cheek to criticise anyone for the chaos, for the utter chaos you brought in. We have set out our alternative clearly. The six tests that we set have been failed and we do not accept what has happened. Two weeks ago, the Prime Minister came to Scotland on her fantasy campaign tour with all the vim and vigour of her actual election campaign, but she characteristically hid from the people she fears most, the voting public. She's the only candidate in an imaginary election who is still heading for a landslide defeat. And when that happens, all bets are off. Such a rejection would be an unprecedented failure of government and a personal humiliation for the Prime Minister. Her government has been found guilty of contempt of Parliament. It's lost two Brexit secretaries, a series of ministers, 
The Tory party is revolting in many ways. The DUP have deserted them. And yesterday in Parliament, they were defeated not once, but on three occasions. A rejection in such a key area of government policy leaves the government unable to govern or deliver its programme. In such circumstances, then it is my view that the government has lost the confidence of Parliament and the country and that a general election should be called. Finally, President Officer, if the last few years has shown us anything, it is this. The world is an interconnected place where businesses and people work together, where relationships grow and develop across borders and where we communicate and trade at the click of a mouse. Unraveling 40 years of economic and political relationship building is self-evidently a monumental and complicated tax task. I hope this painful and paralyzing experience provides much food for thought also for the cabinet secretary, his government and his party. Finally, President Officer, the Prime Minister's days are numbered. For the sake of the country, our economy, for jobs, for our children, our environment and the rights we enjoy, the Prime Minister should admit the game is up and let democracy prevail in a general election. Can I remind members that even during interventions, they should always speak through the chair. And I call Ross Greer, six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. It's a sorry situation that we've been put in today, one which the chaotic, dying Conservative government are responsible for. Not Michelle Barney, not the EU27, not those of us who campaigned for Remain. This is a crisis of the Tory party, which they have turned into a profound national crisis. Scotland's decisive vote to remain has been completely disregarded. No attempt has been made to accommodate it or even to recognise it. The withdrawal agreement and the declaration on future partnership put Scotland and the wider UK in a worse place than we are currently in. They are not the sunny uplands that the liars of the Leave campaign promised. Free movement will be ended. The social, cultural and economic benefits brought to Scotland by European citizens will be restricted. The right of our citizens to move, to live, to work across the EU will be lost. This is a process of reducing our rights and our opportunities. Scotland's aspirations to be an open and an outward looking society will be undermined. Our universities and our world class research centres will be unable to attract the best talent. The Tories intend to take us out of the single market, particularly for services, which for a service-based economy like the UK's is simply self-sabotage. Labour standards and environmental standards are certainly not protected by this agreement. There's some positive language, a bit of rhetoric, a commitment to maintain a so-called level playing field. But when you look at the detail, it completely falls apart. These provisions are exempt from arbitration rules and apply only temporarily under the protocols on the island of Ireland under the withdrawal agreement. Instead, there's a reliance on the UK creating its own domestic enforcement procedures. Given that Britain routinely breaks legal limits on air pollution and has the weakest employment protections in Europe, the loss of EU level enforcement should be a concern to all of us. For all of this, the loss of free movement, the loss of single market membership, the loss of these protections for the environment and labour standards, we're going to pay almost 40 billion. Now, even if Brexit does happen, the UK, of course, has an obligation to a number of European funding streams, not least the pensions of those who've served us as a member state, for example. But even the Tory negotiators must concede that paying to lose out on rights, on privileges and on advantages, paying to be poorer is a ridiculous place to be. And so many issues have just been kicked into the long grass. Permanent provisions on labour and environmental standards, on our level of access to the single market, whether the Irish backstop will have to be implemented long term, these all remain to be negotiated. There's one thing that the Brexiteers, I think, have accurately grasped, is I think it's just how likely that the Irish backstop does become a permanent or certainly a long term arrangement. That's because they have been unable to come up with the magical alternative solution over the last two years that they've promised us. And no one seriously believes that they're going to be able to come up with it over the next couple of years. This is a deal so chronically unappealing that the two Brexit secretaries allegedly responsible for it have resigned to vote against it. And I can't see how it will pass the UK Parliament. It's a bad deal for Scotland, democratically, economically, environmentally, societally, culturally, and so much more. It's a bad deal for every part of the UK. And it was dead on arrival in the Commons yesterday, delivered by a government that's collapsing before our eyes. This is a government that was found in contempt of Parliament, a government who have lost the confidence and supply of their own partners, a government who have suffered more ministerial resignations than any other in modern history. 
This is not a government fit to take us out of this crisis. This government is the crisis. They are the cause of this crisis. What this parliament will do today by rejecting this deal, which it seems that about half of the Conservative Party's own MPs may end up doing as well, and by rejecting the absolute disaster of a no-deal exit, is to say clearly, on behalf of the people of Scotland, that there is a better way. There are a number of better ways. Indeed, yesterday, a better way became clearer than ever. The Greens have been clear that Brexit is not inevitable, and yesterday, the EU's Attorney General agreed with that position. I was proud to be one of those who brought a case through the Court of Session to the European Court of Justice seeking clarity on whether and how Article 50 could be revoked should the UK Parliament or the public so choose. I was proud to do that alongside Green, SNP and Labour colleagues joined by the Good Law Project. Whilst we sought to maximise the options available to the UK Parliament and Government, that same UK Government sought to prevent us at every step of the way and to limit their own options. Responsible governments don't limit their own options, they maximise them. The Attorney General of the Court of Justice has been absolutely clear that in his opinion, Article 50 can be unilaterally revoked by the UK. The Scottish Greens are absolutely clear that this deal should be rejected by Parliament, that Article 50 should be revoked. That will respect Scotland's vote to remain, and it won't just be in our best interest, it will be in the best interest of every nation and region of the UK. Now, of course, ultimately the Greens' ambition is to see an independent Scotland as a full member state of the EU with a seat at the table. We want to work towards a people's Europe alongside our friends and neighbours. But that isn't for today, though. Today we stand alongside those who agree with that constitutional position and those who believe that Scotland is stronger as part of the UK. We stand together to prevent something which none of us are in any doubt will damage Scotland. The Greens hope that the final say on this deal can be put back in the hands of the people and that the deal be put on the ballot paper up against the option of revoking Article 50 and clearly saying that the benefits of staying in the EU are still available to us. As the Prime Minister herself has said, what Mr Tompkins failed to mention during his speech opening this debate was that the Prime Minister laid out three options. She laid out her deal, which is dead on arrival. She laid out no deal, which is clearly no longer an option. And she laid out the option of no Brexit at all. That is on the table. We do this today, we've held this debate today because we are all in no doubt that it's in the best interest of the people of Scotland to reject the deal and to reject no deal. And as such, I am proud to co-propose the motion before us. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Greer. I call on Tavish Scott to open for Liberal Democrats. Mr Scott, please. Um, we should thank the Conservatives for a couple of things at the start of the debate. Firstly, they've reintroduced Alec Neil to the uh, front bench. And secondly, they've made sure that Neil Finlay described uh, Willie Rennie accurately, which cannot be said to have happened in the past. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this is a UK government in contempt of Parliament for the first time in history. A UK government who have published legal advice, again without precedent. And all that greatest of ironies, Mr Tompkins, a UK Parliament that have taken back control. Three government defeats in one day. Last night, 26 Tory MPs backed Dominic Greaves' amendment, including former cabinet ministers and May loyalists such as Damien Green and Michael Fallon. The end cannot be far away. All created by the ructions in the Conservative Party over the UK's relationship with Europe. So why are the Scottish Tories following the last man standing approach to politics? Their unapologetic support for the Prime Minister and her withdrawal agreement is ludicrous. Ludicrous not because of opposition to Theresa May's deal, not because the UK government's own analysis now shows our economy will be weaker with the deal, but ludicrous because the Prime Minister will be defeated by her own side. The Prime Minister is going to lose the vote next Tuesday, yet her last defenders, and that of her deal, are the Scottish Tories. What don't they understand about what's going on? I can only observe that Adam Tompkins took no interventions today because he doesn't believe a word of what he said in this debate. <laughs> Next Tuesday at 7pm, the House of Commons will not be about socialists, nationalists, Liberal Democrats or even the DUP. Westminster will be about the fisher in the Tory party, a party who never could agree on Europe. From Churchill to Theresa May, every Tory leader ripped asunder by their own party over Europe. Few are convinced following yesterday's farce that Theresa May will still be the Prime Minister by Tuesday night. It's her deal, it will lose and she will go. The rejection of the Prime Minister's deal next week 
a rejection triggered by the revolt in her own party, will expose the profoundly flawed nature of the June 2016 referendum, a referendum called not to end the corrosiveness of the European question across the UK, but to end the corrosiveness of the European question within the Tory party. And it has not. Britons did vote to leave, narrowly, but no specific version of Brexit was put to the people. Whatever the grievance, and there were plenty, voting leave encapsulated every reason to rebel. One recent poll suggested that 75% of the electorate say the Prime Minister's deal is nothing like that which was promised two years ago. And that's why so many take exception to the Prime Minister's assertion that her deal delivers on the referendum. So many Tories. The Prime Minister's deal means the UK would be transformed from rule makers to rule takers. It enshrines a democratic deficit and a further loss of sovereignty her party will never accept. There is to be a backstop on the border within the island of Ireland. And as we know from today's published legal advice, there is no obvious way out of this backstop. It means protracted and potentially never-ending negotiations with the EU27. It is, as the Brexiteer Dominic Raab stated this morning, a trap. There is one certainty about next week's meaningful vote, that the majority of the House of Commons does not want a hard Brexit one where the UK crashes out of the EU next March with no transitional period, no trading arrangements in place, and monumental economic chaos. The UK's own financial, financial assessment says every citizen will be worse off. Here at Holyrood last Thursday, David Liddington accepted that slower economic growth means less revenues. That means less money for public services. To coin the current language of cuts, Brexit means extending austerity, not reducing it. So much for the £350 million a week for the NHS. All this was neatly summed up by Sam Jima. He resigned as a Tory minister last Friday, the seventh minister to go since the deal was published, saying that voting for the Prime Minister's deal would mean Britain surrendering our voice, our vote and our veto. Presiding officer, so what is the alternative? to the UK failing to agree. Crashing out on the 29th of March next year does not need to happen. It will change if the UK Parliament passes a new law uh, erasing that date. It is now a question of how MPs will act to stop a hard Brexit, not if or when. But as the UK Parliament cannot agree anything other than opposition to a hard Brexit, it is the people who must determine that future. Many sensible Tories are making exactly that case. Joe Johnson, brother of Boris, but a pro-European, resigned saying the deal represents a failure of British statecraft on a scale unseen since the Suez Crisis. For the avoidance of doubt, that is not a compliment to Mrs May's negotiating skills. Mr Johnson is now calling for the deal to be put to the general public in a people's vote. It is to be hoped that the other Johnson once again campaigns for leave. Boris is no longer box office. Last night in the Commons, he was taken apart by his own side. John McDonnell, Labour's Shadow Chancellor, rather than dissing a people's vote, described it, describes it as increasingly inevitable. Justin Greening, the Prime Minister's former Education Secretary, said this morning on today that trusting the people may be, in the end, the only way to break the gridlock in Parliament. Such a vote must test these real alternatives. There may be some consensus in Westminster for a customs union, single market, Norway option. Influential Tories led by Oliver Letwin and a dozen more support this. The Norway option is perhaps best described as moving house but staying in the neighbourhood, although that also includes losing one's seat on the Neighbourhood Watch Committee. Yet, Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, says there will be implications for the financial industry, including here in Scotland. But on Tuesday, the UK Parliament will fail to agree. Then the only real alternative is that the people of the nations and regions of this United Kingdom must determine our future. That's the only way forward. And with six days to go, there is one certainty. The Prime Minister's deal is dead dead at the hands of her own party, but amongst its few de defenders remain the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. They look like lemmings rushing headlong for the cliff edge, demanding mm -hmm. leadership. And I remain staggered that sensible, intelligent Scottish Tories like Adam L Tompkins are joining the lemons as they plunge, plunge into that abyss. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate speeches are six minutes, but there is time in hand for interventions. I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Donald Cameron. Mr. Crawford, please. Thank you, President Officer. You know, like many in this chamber, um, the majority of the people of Scotland, and like the 67.7% of my constituents, 
I voted with my head, my heart and my soul to remain in the European Union. And after, frankly, what was a divisive, dishonest and xenophobic campaign, I was pleased that Scotland voted overwhelmingly to, to, to remain and rejected the case to leave. Of course, many, many good people voted to leave and did so in good faith that would deliver future, a better future for themselves and their families. And I know from canvassing in my own constituency that many of these people are still committed to the Leave cause, and I, for one, 100% respect their position. But it's also true to say that many of these same people feel badly betrayed by the Leave campaign. After two and a half years of revelation after revelation that the promises made by Leave did not, just did not stand up to scrutiny, who can really blame them? Of course, of course the result being today Many of our citizens, for very understandable reasons, just want to see the end of this sorry mess. They're sick to the back teeth of p politicians like the bickering hard Brexiteers without a credible plan who care more for the future of their party than their country. All they're asking for is for politicians to get together, agree a way forward that will not hurt them either economically or just as importantly socially. That's why I'm pleased that today here at Holyrood we have a motion for debate agreed by the SNP government, the Labour, the Greens and the Lib Dems. Today only the Conservatives stand alone and isolated. But I'm not angry with them because I know that many on the Tory benches do not believe that the deal currently represents what is the best possible outcome for Scotland. That's clear from the previous statements made from their benches particularly about the importance of Scotland remaining in the single market. I'm not angry with them because, frankly, the time for anger and emotion has gone. It's now time for hard-headed, clear thinking and a focused determination to work together to secure an outcome that will not damage our country. Certainly. Um, uh, Patrick Harvey, sorry. Thank, thank you. you. I'm, I'm grateful to Mr Crawford for giving way, and he's, he's right about a lot of this, but does he not find it, as I do, quite baffling that the UK Conservative MPs, who nominally are under the same whip, are splitting in every direction. But the MSPs in this Parliament, it's party line, party line, party line. Does he not agree that they need to be willing to say what they really think in, if we're going to get progress that Mr Crawford's calling for? Bruce well, Crawford. Well, let me say again to Patrick Harvey, I'm not angry with them. I'm just sad that they are not yet in a position to work with others here at Holyrood to achieve some, an, such an outcome. That might come after the defeat of Theresa May next Tuesday. Second officer, it's perhaps understandable that much of the debate over the last two and a half years has been about the damaging impact of leaving the European Union. Economic analysis by the UK government, by the Scottish government, by the banks, by respected um, economic institutions all agree on one thing, leaving the EU will make us poorer. Before we've even left the EU, the Governor of the Bank of England has told us that Brexit vote alone has cost households £900 a year when the collapse value of the pound is taken into account. And as far as the current deal is concerned that's on the table, the Scottish Government's analysis showed this would cost each person in Scotland an additional £1,600 a year. These are real people's lives we're talking about, real incomes and their ability to be able to afford to live. And you can be sure of one thing, it will be the very people who can afford it least who will end up paying the biggest price for this folly. And businesses small and large right across the country are already feeling the strain from the reduced spending power of their customers. And I would not be fulfilling my duties as the MSP for Stirling if I didn't speak out against this absolute madness from the UK government, who for the first time in history are actually planning to make people poorer. President officer, I now like to turn to the important issue in the time I've got left of citizens across the EU. For generations, people from the UK have moved freely about the EU, where they have lived, where they have worked and where they have loved. But the coming generation risk having that freedom stolen away from them by politicians obsessed by reducing the number of people coming from the EU who simply want to seek and do the same here. People who are our friends, used as a bargaining chip, 
to gain some perceived advantage either politically or as part of negotiations. And that's led EU citizens living in our country to have very real fears and anxieties about their future. Alenka, a Slovenian national, a lecturer at Stirling said, many of our friends are already leaving. It's like they are jumping ship before they are pushed. President officer, these are heartbreaking words from Alenka and they're shared by many others. There are, these are the real fears and anxieties of real people and to treat them in this way is an absolute disgrace. In closing, if we've learned anything in the past two and a half years, Brexit flies in the face of those of us who believe in an open, inclusive, compassionate, caring, welcoming, competitive nation. Presiding officer, with cool heads, reasoned arguments, made in the interest of all of the people who call Scotland their home, we can get ourselves out of this mess of this deal. I call on colleagues of all parties in this chamber and the House of Commons, for goodness sake, stand up and be heard. The price of silence is simply too high to pay for too many. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Crawford. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Mr Cameron, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And it's uh, always a pleasure to follow Bruce Crawford, not least given the measured approach in his speech, which I hope to emulate. We are now less than four months away from the point at which the UK will formally leave the European Union. And as we near the end, it's worth remembering the beginning. On the 23rd of June 2016, a question was posed to the United Kingdom and was answered by the United Kingdom about our membership of the EU. And we know the resulting decision. The Prime Minister's deal seeks to implement the decision of the electorate for the UK to end its membership. And so for me, the central reason to support this deal is that it respects that decision and delivers an outcome consistent with that decision. But, of course. Um, Cabinet Secretary. I, I respect the member, and I, I know he does believe that, but would he reflect upon the fact, for example, in the YouGov poll today, that now fewer than four in 10 people in the UK think the UK was right to vote for Brexit, whilst almost half, 49%, believe it was the wrong decision? Surely times change. Mr. Cameron. I respect the one poll that matters um, here, presiding officer, and that is the decision of the referendum in, on the 23rd of June 2016. Because not to respect that vote would render us guilty of forgetting that we serve those who elected us, and that service includes respecting their decisions freely expressed in a democratic vote. And turning to the withdrawal agreement itself, it is, of course, a complex legal document, a treaty, in fact, and like most legal documents, it is open to interpretation. It has to make provision for a variety of possible outcomes, some of which may never come to pass. It is not perfect. As with any legal settlement reached at the end of a lengthy negotiation, neither side emerges with all that it demanded at the outset. Concessions have been made, circles have been squared on all sides, but this is the reality of any compromise. The stark purity of ideological positions makes way for something less glamorous, but ultimately more practical. We have heard a lot about choices this week. For me, the choice is this. Do we pursue ideology or pragmatism? This deal is pragmatic. It acknowledges the profound divisions inherent in this vote. Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. Given that this is perhaps a less hypothetical question today than it was yesterday, can I ask if the member agrees with Ruth Davidson that if there were another referendum that uh, he would vote to remain? Mr Cameron. There will not be another referendum and therefore I'm, I, we have to play the ball as it lies. This is where we are, we are at. This, this deal is pragmatic. It recognises the closeness of this vote. But beyond that, it faces up to the anxieties of the vast majority of people who want this deal to be supported for the very reason that it protects their jobs and their livelihoods. It provides for an orderly withdrawal from the EU. That's why Scottish business has backed it. Scotch whisky, one of the most important industries in my region, the Highlands and Islands, vital for the Scottish economy, have said this in the um, name of the Scotch Whisky Association. If the deal is rejected, this will create considerable uncertainty for the industry. Diageo, who owns many whisky brands across Scotland, says it is now vital for business confidence that Parliament votes in favour of this deal. And last Friday, 
I met with a livestock farmer in Lochaber, and I refer to farming in my register of interest. That farmer simply wants to get on with his work. He will have lambs to sell in the spring, and he urged me to support the deal. Farming is, of course, hugely important to the Scottish economy, and that's why it is no wonder that the NFUS have said, and I quote, the deal will ensure that there are no hard barriers on the day we leave the EU and will allow trade in agricultural goods and UK food and drink to continue throughout the transition period, largely as before. This opportunity needs to be taken. I repeat, this opportunity needs to be taken. In taking the withdrawal agreement and the declaration together, we have a deal that provides clarity on our status as an independent coastal nation by 2020. We have a deal that ensures that the environment remains protected. We have a deal which aims to protect trade in goods, something which is crucial for our many exporters. I'm sorry, I'm going to carry on. I've taken a few already. Crucial for Scotland's exporters who require to deliver their goods to European markets. And above all, and to answer the question that Mr. Russell mentioned about migration, we have a deal that ensures EU citizens who live and work in the UK can continue to do so. But despite this clear progress, there are still people who want to see this process fail. For the SNP have never wanted Brexit to work. Whatever deal Theresa May had negotiated with Brussels, the SNP would have opposed it. An orderly withdrawal is not in their interests. That's why they're rejecting this deal. So we plunge into the uncertainty from which they hope to salvage independence. That's their ambition, and it always has been. And it's extraordinary because the deal meets many of the SNP's demands, including transition period, no hard border, a guarantee for EU citizens' rights, and the likelihood of a customs partnership. Better alternatives are not on the table. Jean-Claude Juncker has said this is the only deal possible, and that those who think by rejecting the deal they would have a better deal will be disappointed. That from the President of the EU Commission. This is it, and as I've said before, we have to play the ball as it lies. And I am content, presiding officer, that when I look my constituents in the eye and explain why I support this deal, given the uncertainty that would result if it falls, I can do so firmly in the knowledge that I have acted in their best interests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Cameron. I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Ms McAlpine, please. Thank you, presiding officer. The Prime Minister's claim for two years that no deal was better than a bad deal. Now she's attempting to intimidate the country to back her bad deal by threatening a cliff-edge bre Brexit. I'm therefore delighted that this motion unites all the parties of this parliament, with the dishonourable exception of the Scottish Conservatives, to oppose a no-deal Brexit. The House of Commons also expressed that view by backing the Dominic Grieve amendment yesterday, and I'm confident that the amendment by Hilary Benn, backed by the SNP and others, will also be successful. The opinion of the European Advocate General that Article 50 can be rescinded further eliminates the risk of no deal, so there is an alternative. Yet the Scottish Conservatives continue to claim that Mrs May's bad deal is our only option, even saying that is the view from Europe. But there's a crucial omission in that narrative, presiding officer. This is the only deal that the EU could give, given Mrs May's red lines. That was a strong message from the influential people that the European Committee met during its recent trip to Brussels in the European Parliament. The withdrawal agreement is what it is because Mrs May boxed herself in with those rigid red lines. Her obsessive determination to end freedom of movement, her foolhardy commitment to take the UK out of a single market of 500 million people, her obstinate insistence on leaving a customs union that gives the UK preferential trading agreements with 60 third countries as well as real frictionless trade with the EU27. If Mrs May dropped those red lines, we could reach a far better agreement with the EU, and it's vital that happens. Others have already outlined the evidence provided by the UK government itself on the economic, uh, economic damage that will ensue from leaving the single market and the customs union. I want, therefore, to concentrate on another of this deal's red lines, the determination to end freedom of movement, and specifically how that will damage Scotland. Figures from the National Records of Scotland show all of Scotland's projected population increase over the next 10 years will be due to migration. Furthermore, an end to EU migration would result in a 3% decline in the working age population over the next 25 years, while the pensionable age population is projected to increase by a quarter. 
We need the taxes of working people to pay for public services in the future. So that those statistics should be of concern to every single person in this chamber. However, when my colleague Angela Constance, MSP, put this to David Liddington last week at the joint meeting of the Finance and European Committees of this Parliament, he was completely unaware. He cited the Migration Advisory Committee, whose report for the government is supposed to inform the upcoming immigration bill at Westminster. But the MAC had no Scottish representation and it did no Scottish modelling. Its chairman, Professor Manning, gave evidence to the Culture, Tourism, European External Affairs Committee in November and what he said shocked us so much that the committee has written to the Home Secretary to share our concerns. The MAC, of course, wants to end nearly all immigration in what it calls low-skilled occupations and it set a £30,000 salary threshold for other migrants considered high-skilled. Professor Manning, when he came before the committee, dismissed the concerns of businesses who said this would make it impossible for them to recruit. And he shocked the committee when he said that the UK should not focus on the needs of the hospitality or agriculture sectors. The NFUS, uh, when they came before our committee last week, used the words disappointed and shocked in response to um, uh, Professor Manning's comments. Professor Manning also dismissed the advice from Oxford Economics, which advised this committee and who said that tax rises may be needed to compensate for the fall in revenue if immigration is restricted. The MAC itself suggested that the pension age may need to rise again to fill the black hole in tax revenues that these policies will result in. There's a reason why the immigration bill remains unpublished. To do so before the withdrawal agreement vote would terrify business further and increase opposition to this deeply damaging deal. In conclusion, presiding officer, I have outlined now how just one of Mrs May's red lines will damage our country, and it's those red lines which have shaped this deal. Yesterday, she described her deal as a compromise. It's nothing of the kind. But it has brought us together in opposition to her deal, and in opposition, critically, to a no deal. And that's why I'm delighted to support this motion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Calpine. I call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Alec Neill. Ms Grant, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to concentrate my remarks on rural Scotland. For generations, we've been fighting depopulation, meaning that communities are disappearing, and with them, the rural economy and subsequent damage to the environment. This is not just an issue for rural communities. Urban dwellers enjoy our rural areas for holidays and days out. However, more importantly, they provide an environmental benefit to all of us. Our urban areas are big polluters and our rural areas redress that balance by providing carbon stores. Therefore, vibrant rural communities are important to us all and we need to protect them. This withdrawal agreement, or indeed a hard Brexit, risks further damage to these communities and puts their very existence in jeopardy. I want to speak about fishing and agriculture which underpin these economies, but also, if I have time, the wider EU understanding of peripherality that needs and the needs of rural communities and understanding that subsequent governments have sadly lacked. It's a strange phenomenon that the sector in Scottish society that wanted out of the EU are the ones who are likely to come off the worst from the withdrawal agreement, and that's the case with fishing. Those who believe that they had most to gain may end up being those that have most to lose. They will be last to leave, they will lose all their influence, and in the case of the backstop, they will face separate trade arrangements for fish, which include, could include trade levies or increased bureaucracy. The withdrawal agreement is the worst of both worlds for them. The EU will negotiate on behalf of the UK with other countries external to the EU, such as Norway, and again during the Council of Ministers negotiations on the common fisheries policy. They will consult with the UK, but there is no requirement to agree consensus. Therefore, quotas could be imposed on the UK that are de detrimental to our industry. And this will go on until we reach agreement with the European Union as to access and quota arrangements going forward. And the European Union is clear that such an agreement builds onto the common fisheries policy, something that is unacceptable to our fishing communities. 
As I listened to the debate about the wider transitional arrangements and the backstop, it would appear that this situation could carry on indefinitely. There is a real chance that this will become the new reality because it is difficult to see what arrangements for a barrier-free Ireland could be agreed on, especially with, and that's especially the case with those parties currently at the table. And failure to agree a solution for Ireland will mean that the backstop comes into place. Frankly, if we do not get a general election, the fishing community will be rule takers for the foreseeable future. And you could hardly believe that it can't get any worse, but with fishing it can. Under the backstop arrangements, access to EU markets for fish, including farm fish, is dependent on agreement being reached on quota and access to UK waters. Therefore, this deal does not meet the aspirations of our fishing communities. Delays and import charges will have a disproportionate impact on small, smaller fishing operations who have tighter margins. Any delay getting catch to market can mean the whole lot is destroyed and few boats can withstand that for any length of time. In addition, the charging of Im an import levy will eat into already tight margins for smaller operations. Currently, these boats are enjoying greater profits because of the level of the pound. But if that changes, along with import levies being imposed, they could face a steep drop in their income. It could be argued that these boats play a greater role in sustaining fragile communities and their reduction would have a greater impact on population levels. Even a hard Brexit would not make this better as negotiations would be carried out on the same basis with the European Union demanding access to our water and quota in return to, for a barrier-free exit to their markets. While agriculture has been better uh, served, it is not straightforward either. Any extension to the transitional arrangements would leave us outside the common agricultural policy and subject to World Trade Organization terms. Added to that, there is a stipulation in the agreement that any support given to agriculture during the extend, an extended transition period cannot be higher than the common agriculture policy support levels that had been given in the previous year. That could mean an extended transition would mean the support levels drop in real terms. If so, we cannot rebalance support payments, something that we must do to ensure that those areas dependent on these payments enjoy a greater share of that support. It's currently wrong that those farming in the most difficult areas receive less, while the greater, um, the, those, despite their greater disadvantage and higher operational costs. The withdrawal agreement also states that there will be a joint committee set up between the EU and UK to set a minimum amount of payments made to schemes such as agri-environmental support and basic payments. Therefore, we will not have control over our agricultural support payments, but be subject to agreement with the EU, again taking the rules with none of the benefits. I mentioned fishing and agriculture specifically as, as the rural e economy is dependent on these industries. In many parts of rural Scotland, these are fragile industries and any detriment to them will have an impact on the communities that are already under pressure. Presiding officer, I'm not sure if I have more time just to touch on peripheral. She's saying no. If you could um, just begin to wind up, please. Give you another little bit. Um, Presiding officer, the Labour Party six tests say that we should protect the benefits we enjoy as part of the EU and we should have a close collaborative relationship. This deal nor the transition agreement do this. A hard Brexit would be even worse for every sector. We need a de deal we can coalesce around. Until the, the Conservative government start listening, that will be impossible. Thank you very much. I call Alec Neil to be followed by Liz Smith. Mr Neil, please. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I say the one thing about Theresa May's draft withdrawal agreement is that it has brought about a level of unity between Remainers and Brexiteers, <laughs> even in the SNP, that I never <laughs> thought I would see for a long time. But can I say, as someone who voted for Brexit, I am totally opposed to this proposed deal. Uh, because, in my view, it is the worst of all possible worlds and the best of none. It is neither fish nor fowl. 
And one of the main issues for me is the impact of the backstop proposal, and I'll explain that in some detail in a minute. I accept the backstop proposal is well intentioned, but the way it is drafted is utterly foolhardy. To quote Lord Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England, in today's Daily Telegraph, I must get him to write for a better paper. <laughs> uh, he says, leaving the EU is not the end of the world any more than it will deliver the promised land. Nonetheless, the UK is entitled to expect something better than a muddled commitment to perpetual subordination from which Britain cannot withdraw without the agreement of the EU. Now, the purpose of the backstop is absolutely the right thing to try to do and that is to avoid a hard border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, an objective with which I think everybody in this chamber will agree. Uh, and what many people in the chamber might not realise, that in actual fact it's already the law of the land of the United Kingdom as a result of an amendment made by Lord Patton during the passage of the Withdrawal Act, that it's illegal for us to do anything uh, to create a hard border in Ireland. That's already the law of our land as it should be. But under the current draft of the backstop agreement, and this was confirmed by the Attorney General Geoffrey Cox uh, two days ago, this could tie us permanently into a particular type of customs deal, which would be detrimental to our economy, but with no prospect of a get-out option. We could only exit the backstop with the permission of the EU. That would be like a tenant, since I'm sitting next to the housing minister, that would be like a tenant needing the permission of the landlord to give up the lease, while the landlord retains the right to increase the rent annually and impose ridiculous new conditions on the tenant. Similarly to exit, the backstop would need the permission of 27 other nation states, any one of which could use their veto to keep the UK in the backstop against our wishes unless and until we agree to all of their individual demands. Thus, the EU would have the UK over a barrel, not just in relation to the backstop itself, and this is extremely important, but in relation to all aspects of the future trading relationship between the UK and the EU which is still to be negotiated. This isn't a calculated, hold on a minute, this isn't a calculated risk as claimed by the Attorney General. It is utter folly, which no self-respecting legislator could ever vote for. And talking of self-respecting legislators, I'll let in Mr. Finlay. Mr. Finlay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I agree with a great deal of what Mr. Neil has said. I wonder if I could invite him to lay into the Scottish Tories here by using his house, housing analogy. Using his housing analogy, Northern Ireland would have rents much cheaper than Scotland would under the provisions of the backstop. Yeah, I do, Mr. Neil. A, a point, I don't know if it was worthwhile taking the intervention right enough. <laughs> but uh, anyway, let us look at the implications of the backstop. And particularly, let's look at the implications for a fishing industry. Already, President Macron is on record as saying that he could refuse to end the backstop unless the EU retains control, as it does at the present time, of 60% of the UK's fishing waters, uh, as happens under the common fisheries policy. In that circumstance, we would be out of the CFP in name only, but in reality, our fishermen would be no better off than they are today. And if I may say so to the leadership of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, I'm amazed that they're recommending approval of this particular agreement. I think it's high time they woke up and smelt the coffee by recommending approval of this withdrawal deal. They're endangering the whole future of the Scottish fishing industry. They need to rethink their position and do so quickly. But it's not just France. Spain can say we're not gonna let you out the backstop without another deal on Gibraltar. Other countries can say you're not getting it without dipping into a financial services sector in Edinburgh and London. 
They can demand anything they like, and they'll keep demanding and demanding and demanding a great economic and social cost to us. If we sign this deal, they have got us over the proverbial barrel. It would be an economic disaster to sign this deal with that backstop provision in it. And returning again to Lord Mervyn King, he said having this deal is the result of incompetence on a monumental scale. This from the people in London who tell us we can't run our own country. Presiding officer, when you look at this deal, not only can we run our country better than them, we can run England better than them. Thank you. I call Liz Smith to be followed by Tom Arthur. Ms. Smith, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. When I made uh, my decision to vote to remain, I didn't need much persuasion, because I did so mainly for economic reasons. I felt both British and Scottish trade would be fair much better in a European market where there was free movement of goods and services, where the scope for economies of scale were strengthened, and I felt that key sectors such as energy and oil, technology, medical science and our universities would flourish better, and that our new emerging markets would also fare better with the opportunities that the EU presented. I still believe these things today. But I had to recognise that for all these economic advantages, 52% of UK voters, including many Scots, including the Daily Telegraph reading Alex Neil, felt otherwise. They felt that they were convinced that these economic advantages were outweighed by the political problems presented by an EU which was increasingly seen as bureaucratic, insufficiently democratic because it was increasingly unresponsive to the needs of the sovereign state and profligate with and not sufficiently accountable for taxpayers' money. As with all political debate, there was truth on both sides. I found it very hard, Deputy Presiding Officer, to conceal my disappointment in June 2016. And I have found it very hard ever since, especially when I see the rancour and division and bitterness which has swept aside decency and tolerance in many quarters of political life. The Brexit debate has, for the whole country, raised questions about the meaning of democracy. And I want to dwell on that for just a moment. We have heard much in recent days about the overriding need of the sovereign parliament at Westminster to reflect the views of the country. Just as we heard at the time of the Scottish independence referendum about how well this parliament in which we all sit now reflects the will of the people in Scotland. There is a common thread. Before 2014, we were rightly told that the will of the people is paramount and that whatever decision is made, we should abide by it. Exactly what we were told prior to the EU referendum. And I, for one, believe strongly that we should accept that democracy is the important side of that, even if we personally happen to be on the wrong side of the outcome. Yes, of course. I'm interested in the member's view. Does she therefore think that democracy is just an act of one cross in a box every four years, or does she genuinely believe that when the facts change, people should be entitled to change their mind as well? Liz Smith. What, what I believe very strongly, Ms Dugdale, is that if we continue to reject the voters' decisions and tell them that we, they were wrong by seeking to have more referendums until we get the vote that we want, then we enter very dangerous territory when the political classes become dislocated from the public who elect them. That presiding officer would, in my view, undermine the whole concept of democracy as we know it. Now, I respect the views of all members in this chamber, even if I can't agree with them all the time. So I respect other parties' decision to have this debate this afternoon. But I ask the other parties to consider when the motion that they have put forward is not able to give us what they actually want. It's very clear what they don't want, but it's not clear, and how could it be clear, given the um, situation in which all these four parties have found themselves, it is not clear about what they actually want. They are adamant that the Prime Minister's deal is a bad one, but they will not spell out in their eyes what is a good one. All they will tell us is that they want to stay in the EU. So do I. But that isn't what the people decided, and as Democrats we must live with that, whether we like it or not, of course. It rumbles. A member familiar with philosophers such as Edmund Burke, who said parliamentarians need to use their own judgment 
and not be reliant on the power of public opinion. They are... They are oh, I, I see the Tories don't like that. He's often promoted by the Tories, as Edmund Burke. Don't parliamentarians owe the people a duty to use their own judgment? Ms Smith. Mr Rumbles, I would remind you that we are here at the behest of the public who elect us to any parliament. Uh, and that is the point about this particular issue. If we keep telling the public that they are wrong in their decision making, well, I think we are telling them that they're wrong at the moment because that's exactly what the I, Excuse me a minute. I don't want a discussion. I understand why you've responded. Just don't respond. I don't want discussions across the floor. Well, Deputy but President, the I, chair. Quite, I quite like to respond because the, I think it's a yes, part then, of the debate. With respect, Ms. Smith, Mr. Rumbles has to get to his feet and intervene so we all hear it and it's on the record. So just to deal with what you're dealing with. Thank you. Okay, presiding officer. I, I think the, the, the other parties are very adamant that this Prime Minister's deal is a bad one. But I do believe very strongly, I think I'll, I'll make some progress if you don't mind, Dr. Allen. They have to spell out what it is that they want. And we've seen that this afternoon, that it is not clear what they want. And can I, can I come back to the point that, that this, this deal is not perfect? We know that. And it's not surprising, given the extent of the complexities and the lengthy negotiations that have had to be undertaken, but the central tenants deliver on what the people of the UK voted for. I might not like that, but that is what they voted for. It ends British membership of the CAP and the CFP, both of which have failed to deliver what these sectors are actually wanting. And I think we should listen to what these sectors are saying. Adam Tompkins said that there, you know, there has been a joint statement from the heads of the UK's four national farmers union, unions backing the deal. Bertie Armstrong of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation has backed the deal, Mr Neil. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce back the deal. Sir Ian Wood backs the deal. The Scottish Whiskey Association backs the deal. But these are not people who are arguing about the abstract and finer points of the Constitution, but about what is best for their sectors in terms of the stability and the future, securing jobs and investment. And I think, Deputy Presiding Officer, we should listen to them. Thank you very much. Just to remind members, intervene if you wish to take part in a debate. Don't have it across the floor of the chamber. Uh, I now call on Tom Arthur to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Mr Arthur, please. The presiding officer, it is a matter of profound regret that this debate is required. Along with the overwhelming majority of my Renfrewshire South constituents and the people of Scotland, I voted to remain a member of the European Union. Following the referendum in September 2016, I stated in this chamber that while I regretted the result, I accepted it. However, I made clear that I did not accept that a vote to leave the European Union was a vote to leave the single market. And I maintain that membership of the single market and the customs union is the only workable, workable alternative to remaining a full member of the European Union. Unless economic vandalism and social dislocation is the objective, that is the genuine choice. It is the only choice. And any politician or pundit who suggests otherwise is little more than a con artist. The case put forward by the UK government shamelessly and sadly supported by Tory MSPs in this place, many of whom I respect and who have debased themselves to the status of underlings and shills, the cat case put forward is a packet full of falsehoods. It is a fraud. And it's perhaps symptomatic of where we have got to with the Tories, because having witnessed their previous arguments collapse under the weight of their inherent falsehoods, the Tories have been reduced to advocating for the Prime Minister's deal as a means to end the ordeal that they have inflicted upon the country. Back the deal and it will all be over by Christmas. Presiding officer, no self-respecting politician should countenance such a feeble and fraudulent argument. Now I know that many people are scunnered with Brexit and I resent the way that this whole dismal debate over the past two years has sucked the oxygen out of so much of our wider public and political conversation. I genuinely empathise with those who just want this whole sorry saga to be over with. Ha certainly. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. And I, I also understand the desire of many people to have this 
over, but there is no such thing as just getting on with it. Those who just say, can't we just get it done? There is only a specific path ahead. There is not a general path ahead. Whether we have this deal from Theresa May or a no deal scenario, in either case, what comes after that is year after year, possibly even decades of constant revisionist uh, approach to these debates on environmental protections. What does the UK government want to do in relation to the European Emission Trading Scheme? They say they uh, want no, a separate no, Mr. UK Harvey, it's trading an intervention, scheme, not but they're speech. unable to answer any questions no, on these please matters. Please sit down. Thank you. I remind people intervention to be short, sharp and interesting. Mr. Arthur. I was not reflecting, Mr. Harvey, Mr. Harvey, before you look peaked, I was not referring to your particular intervention. It was a general comment. Mr. Arthur. Well, can I actually, I, I want to, I think the points that Patrick Harvey made were very well made and very important. And fundamentally, it, it gets to the heart of what is occurring here because the argument put forward by the UK government is based on three fundamental deceptions. Firstly, that the Prime Minister's deal is a good deal. Secondly, that it is the only deal. And thirdly, that it ends uncertainty. At the heart of the withdrawal agreement are a trio of key flaws. Ending freedom of movement, leaving the single market, and leaving the customs union. The arguments for why each of these objectives would represent a mistake of historic proportions have been well rehearsed, and the evidence is overwhelming. There is no public service, no sector of the Scottish economy, or area of our civil society that will be enhanced by this isolationist approach. And the xenophobic undertones, coupled with the jingoistic British exceptionalism that have been a dark presence throughout this whole Brexit process, have already led to settled EU citizens packing their bags and others choosing not to come to the UK in the first place. That this abhorrent approach is celebrated by the UK government as ending freedom of movement once and for all ensures that, whatever the outcome of the ensuing weeks, this period will be seen by current and future generations as one of the most shameful episodes of recent UK history. Presiding officer, however, the most cynical deception that the Tories are seeking to perpetrate is that the withdrawal agreement brings an end to uncertainty, as Patrick Harvey said. I wish it did. I wish I could tell my constituents after March 29th next year they would never hear another mention of the word Brexit. However, if I did that, I would be a liar. This deal does not represent the end or even the beginning of the end. And given the arithmetic of the House of Commons, it's unlikely to even be the end of the beginning. Were this deal to be ratified, it would represent only the conclusion of the easiest phase of Brexit. Years of detailed negotiations on a future agreement, agreement are what would await. They would be between the EU, a trading and regulatory superpower, and the UK, a politically fractured state that hasn't conducted negotiations on this scale in almost half a century. Presiding officer, in conclusion, this evening we and our national parliament will make our voice heard. We will overwhelmingly support this joint motion, reject the withdrawal agreement and put the interests of Scotland and the UK first. If the Tories genuinely care about the national interest, Scottish or British, and if they genuinely care about their country more than their party, they will join us. Thank you. Uh, and can I, can I say to Mr. Arthur, there was a couple of um, terms you used at the beginning of your speech. I was we were uncomfortable with them. They were colourful, but I think they verged on close to unparliamentary. Just a little cautionary tale to everybody in here to make sure they speak with respect to members. Uh, I call Pauline McNeill to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you. I will be supporting the motion tonight as I think it's an important signal from the Scottish Parliament that this deal is not acceptable to those parties. It does not protect Scotland's interests and will damage the UK economy. The road out of Europe must be based on what is best for our country and not what is best for saving political face. We've been, we're leaving after 40 years without a credible plan. And I respect the contribution that Liz Smith made uh, in just a few minutes ago, but. I would say this to, to Liz Smith, democracy does not mean accepting any deal. Democracy does not mean 
ignoring the 48% of people who voted. And it does not mean flouting the views of our parliament. That is not democracy either. The UK has never been so divided as it currently is in the wake of the Brexit vote, and our future has never been so uncertain. The magnitude of Brexit is the largest shock of our economy in our lifetime. David Cameron, I believe, made one of the poorest judgment calls of any Prime Minister in history and has stressed the future of the United Kingdom and all it contains and the economy. But it is up to us as elected members and those who partake in this debate to manage the deep divisions and find a way through that does not make families poorer. We are always hearing about how we have to respect the outcome of the vote, and I have, and that we don't want to be real takers, and I don't want to be, and about the sovereignty of the United Kingdom. But seldom have I heard this Prime Minister also address the prospect of a deal that makes people poorer, that addresses the question of the poverty that may ensue if families do not get a deal. And families that have spent the last 10 years trying to struggle through austerity. But the MPs, the Brexit MPs who laid down their careers, did not care much about the economy and were prepared to sacrifice the living standards of their country to get the outcome that they wanted. You can be sure, I think Neil Findlay said earlier, that it won't be Jacob Rees-Mogg or Andrea Leadsom or Liam Fox who will be the ones at the sharp edge of the economy if we don't get a deal that suits everyone. At least one good thing has come out of it, I think, and that's I don't think there's any prospect that Boris Johnson will ever be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. The withdrawal agreement, and let's remember what we're discussing here is the withdrawal agreement, and it's 500 or so pages. It does not provide any clarity on the future arrangements um, of the deal in the future, and in, uh, that alone is, makes it a deal that I cannot support. <coughs> Um, just to deal with the, the, the ably uh, spoken about by Alec Neil about uh, paragraph 20 of the legal advice, which was published today, clearly states that it affords Northern Ireland access to the single market without any corresponding obligations of membership and splitting the four freedoms. It introduces uncertainty as to what the extent of EU territory customs are for the purposes of trade negotiation. It is obvious that this legal advice needed to be in the public domain, given the magnitude of Brexit, a scenario that we've never faced before. And at a time where the government are asking to be trusted, they have withheld that important information and had to be held in contempt of Parliament for that to be published. This deal seems to have some support, but would you not expect a deal of this importance to command a much wider level of support if it is the deal in which we are expected to withdraw from the European Union. The Tories are now calling on us to support a deal which is going to be voted down. I would have expected the list of support to be, supporters to be much bigger than the list that has been outlined. The deal rules out a permanent customs union with Britain having a say. It does not deliver a good deal in services. It would limit access for British businesses to vital EU markets. It would weaken workers' rights, consumer protection and environmental standards. And as we've said, and have I said in many debates, Scotland needs greater immigration. We need that to support our economy. We need some new arrangements. There has been no concession to that either. So we need a deal which keeps us in the customs union and one which gives us a relationship with a single market that allows us to have access to those key markets. It's the only way that I can see through, through this is the election of a Labour government committed to this. The backstop arrangement has become controversial on all sides of the political divide and no one can say uh, what indeed, whether it will be implemented. It was Theresa May herself that once said um, that, that no deal is better than any deal. And now she's asking us to accept this disastrous deal um, on the table. I have, um, the Scottish Government analysis indicates that under a free trade arrangement, business investments could fall up to 7.7% affecting our overall GDP. It is the equivalent of losing £1,000 per year per person. I have not supported the People's Vote campaign. It's not what I would start from. I wouldn't start from a position 
of trying to reverse a referendum result. And I have argued in every single debate that we should protect the outcome. However, I have to say my patience is wearing thin, trying to respect the outcome of a referendum I never asked for. And ordinary people are fed up with Brexit and they're switching off because of lack of clarity and constant infighting within the Tory party. It concerns me, presiding officer, that at a critical stage where people need to be switched on to what is going to happen in their country, sadly, they're fed up with it all. I want to see a deal that actually protects ordinary people's lives. This is not the deal which does it. And we need to argue and fight for a deal for our country. That's what I'll be doing in the coming months. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Jamie Green. Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. After the election on May the 5th, 2016, a third of our parliamentary intake was brand new. We were all, I think, optimistic about the propensity of this institution to be a force for good. 49 days after the Scottish Parliament election, the Brexit referendum took place. For 40% of today's membership, our entire parliamentary lives thus far have been, in a large part, defined by the subject of today's debate. In our committee meetings, at our surgeries, on the streets in our constituencies, we are, in short, the class of Brexit. What a depressing thought. Now, you can choose, and clearly it suits the agenda of some, to make Brexit about Scotland's constitution. But, presiding officer, for the Scottish Labour Party to join forces with the SNP and us in turn with the Liberals and the Greens, it has to tell you something. This is more than just cross-party working. This is solidarity with Scotland and our people who voted to remain. We need a better deal for Scotland, but as today's motion also makes clear, for the regions and nations of the United Kingdom too. How dare Adam Tompkins come to this chamber and say this debate is just noise? This debate is about the people we all represent. Last year, Fife Centre for Equalities conducted research on the concerns of EU nationals resident across the Kingdom of Fife. The report identified common themes highlighted, uh, including education and the lessening of educational and career outcomes for future generations. Indeed, roughly 20% of St Andrews University's research funding comes from EU sources. Just under a third of staff are EU nationals. The university contributes just under £500 million to the Fife and the wider Scottish economy and about 13% of St Andrews students are EU nationals. Secondly, the report highlighted the economy and negative impacts associated with losing EU workers. Take Balburnie House in Markinch as an example. 12-time winner of Scotland's Wedding Hotel of the Year and recently voted number one in Europe at the Haute Grandeur Awards. The hotel has always employed around about 20% of its workforce from EU countries. Who will take these jobs now? Thirdly, the FCE report flagged concerns about hate or racist speech content becoming more prevalent since the Brexit vote. Channel 4 recently documented the fears of children of EU nationals. Kitty, who was nine when she came to Scotland, reminds me of a former pupil, bright, chatty, smiley, full of optimism. She said, I was on the phone and this woman started shouting at me, saying, you're in an English speaking country, why don't you just learn the language? I just felt really angry, like, why would you say stuff like that? You don't know me. And I can speak English. I speak English perfectly fine. But just because I'm on the phone to my mother, who speaks Hungarian and speaks English as well, and I'm talking to in my mother tongue, which I don't want to lose because that is part of who I am, what gives you the right? Can I say to Kitty from the Scottish Parliament Chamber, no one has the right to speak to you like that. You can speak Hungarian or any other language you want to. You will always be welcome in Scotland. <laughs> Strathclyde University recently conducted research of over a thousand Eastern uh, European children's experiences of living in the United Kingdom. More than three quarters had encountered some form of racist abuse since the Brexit uh, vote. What a painful irony that 2018 is our year of young people when these voices have been so absent from any meaningful debate on Brexit. In standard grade modern studies, the European Union uh, topic featured in the International Relations Unit. I used to teach in a classroom just five miles from this building about the benefits of the European Union uh, and its membership. That was part of our curriculum. Teaching about human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, human rights, the values of the European Union. Spare a thought for those poor modern studies. Yes, I will. Willie Rennie. Is, is right, partly we're in this situation because we failed to make the case for the European Union over many, many decades. And we actually should learn that lesson. We should value the institutions that we do have. 
Uh, the member is probably right that it is a pretty desperate situation if she and I are on the same side of the argument. Um, but the member will know that the Liberal Democrats support a people's vote, as it's pretty clear we can't trust the Prime Minister or indeed the members of the Conservative benches here to make the right decision about what's right for our country. Does she support that proposal too? Jenny Gilruth. And I marched in London um, in support of that proposal. Spare a thought for those then poor modern studies teachers still out there because I don't know how I would even begin to start teaching the next generation about our current political predicament. It is a complete and utter guddle. From removing educational opportunities to losing valuable people with skills and expertise to increasing hate speech. Brexit is bad news for Fife, it is bad news for Scotland, it is bad news for Britain and the Prime Minister knows it. I remember marching in London in 2002 against the war in Iraq. That war politicised a generation of people like me. My school friends and I jumped on a bus from St Andrews to London to march to show our opposition to the government of the day. Fast forward 16 years, it's 2018 and the masses are again stacking the streets around Hyde Park. For miles and miles and miles, people from all over the UK are being mobilised again. I marched with them. Presiding officer, the Prime Minister's plan is not fit for purpose. Yesterday, the ACJ Advocate General provided the opinion that the UK can revoke Article 50. Last night, the House of Commons found the government to be in contempt. And just four hours ago, the UK government was forced to release the Attorney General's legal advice telling us Northern Ireland would be in the EU single market for goods and in the EU customs regime. Well, if it's good enough for Northern Ireland, then it's good enough for Scotland. Yeah. Presiding officer, this parliament should not accept a deal which puts Scotland at a competitive disadvantage. This is a UK government in a, its desperate dying days attempting to grasp onto power. We all as members of this parliament have a duty to represent the best interests of our constituents. From the business owners to the universities to the voices of EU nationals and their children, none of us should accept a deal which applies a detriment to Scotland. 62% of our population voted to remain. It's about time their voices were heard. It's about time they took back control. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie Green to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today's debate really has already been played out in the national media, to be honest. And I think some are seeing it as an opportunity to rerun the debate on whether we should or should not leave the EU. But that's a debate we've already had. And what a sorry debate it has been at times. But opposing this deal is not the same as opposing Brexit. And opposing Brexit is not the same as dealing with the reality that is happening. And I think the preempted and automatic denouncing of the deal that we've heard from so many corners pays a huge disservice to those on both sides of the channel who have worked tirelessly on what I think was a difficult compromise on both sides. Now, I wasn't over the moon with this deal, I'll be honest, but I accept that it was a compromise, in some cases trying to deliver the undeliverable. And I think some people in this room perhaps believe they would get a better deal. But I would ask who in this room has met, who has met with the European Council and agreed an alternative? Thinking, thinking you can get a better deal and realistically achieving a better deal are two entirely different things. I'll give away. Alice Cole Hamilton. Alex Cole Hamilton. Quite a lot to get through. Oh, yeah. Carry on. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. I wonder if the member is aware that currently civil servants are collecting emails involved in the process around negotiation, fully in the expectation of a Chilcot style inquiry around the Brexit negotiations, and wonder if he is absolutely satisfied that this is the best culmination of two years of work on behalf of Her Majesty's civil servants. Jamie Green. Uh, well, I met with some of those civil servants on a recent trip to Brussels, and I was impressed by their dedication and service to what they're trying to achieve. Uh, and I, I, I in no way want to undermine that today. Uh, if I could make some progress, I've got quite a lot to get through. I want to look at some of the confusing uh, motivations behind uh, the motion today. And let me start with the Labour Party, because this, as far as I can tell, is their view on what should happen next. Let's have a general election, they say. And if they can't have that, let's have another referendum, they say. And if they can't have another referendum, let's vote down the Prime Minister, 
they say. And if we can't vote down the Prime Minister, then let's vote down the government. Well, call me cynical. Call me cynical, presiding officer. But it reeks of nothing but opportunism at every stage of the way. And they are participating in it as Order, well. Please. And all of that, all of that comes with Order, no please. alternative. Mr Finlay was given the opportunity. What is your alternative? Nothing was offered. Jeremy Corbyn is the only person on Twitter who never posts about Brexit. And why is that? Because nobody knows whether he really wants to leave the EU or not. Let's look at the SNP position. Let's look at the SNP position. And I respect that they believe in their position. Scotland should stay in Europe. And if we can't stay in Europe, let's stay in the single market. That has been consistently their position throughout all of this. The problem is, presiding officers, that this was a UK-wide referendum. And by its nature, by its very nature, by its nature, every vote is as valid as the next. And that includes the votes of the one million Scots who voted to leave too. It includes the 43% of voters in North Ayrshire who voted to leave too. Every vote counted. That is how we fought the independence referendum. And this was no different. The ramifications of not respecting the outcome of that vote sets a very, very difficult precedent, in my view. No least for the SNP, and that is why I do not support another vote. And that is why I'm surprised that the centre benches do. Now let me talk about their second option, and that is that Scotland should stay in the single market. We've all heard that you cannot have the perks of club membership without accepting the rules of that club. And the rules of that club mean accepting the four freedoms that the EU holds so dear to its chest. If it is a viable option, if it is a viable option, no one who wants to be a member of the single market is yet to explain to this chamber how they will achieve that, but we can still come out of the common fisheries or agricultural policy. No one has provided any credible solution to the conundrum of how is Scotland, let me, let me make my point, no one has provided any solution of how Scotland within a single market and England out of it will not have to deal with the very same difficult issues that is facing the island of Ireland. It is implausible, in my view. I'll, I'll give way to the... I, I can now give you two answers, the first of which is the, uh, the situation in Ireland, which is precisely the situation I'm describing. But the second one, of course, in terms of membership of the single market, uh, is, applies to Norway. And indeed, that is the Norway option, which you have outlined, which would work very effectively, as the Scottish Government put forward in December 2016. Jamie Green. If the Scottish Government put forward, then what did the EU say to you in response? What was their view on, on that option? <laughs> Presenting officer, I sit on this Parliament's Europe Committee, and that is represented by every party in this chamber. Recently, we went to Brussels, and meeting after meeting, expert after expert, civil servants, diplomats, lawyers, politicians, they all had the same frank message for us. Time is running out. The deal we negotiated is as good as it gets. Those were their words, not mine. Does that, does that disappoint me? Yes, it does, but that is what we heard. That is the reality of the message we were given. Now, it's been said uh, by previous members that we are blindly supporting the deal. Uh, far from it, and let me tell you why. Because I was intent on being suspicious of things like the backstop, and I hear what Alex Neil is saying, but anyone who understands the uniqueness of Northern Ireland will understand why it exists, and why it should never be used. Neither party in this game has anything to gain from endless transition. And I went to Europe and I listened to Europe. The EU has enough on its plate. France has much more on its mind. Italy has much more on its mind. We are fooling ourselves. We think that Europe is willing to renegotiate. In closing, presiding officer, the reason I will be voting against the motion today is not because I think Theresa May's deal is unconditionally perfect. And I'm happy to put that on the record. But in the real world, we are facing the reality of crashing out of Europe with no deal at all. You might win your vote, but what will you have achieved? And if any politician, any politician succeeds in thwarting the democratic will of the UK, good luck with that. You will have won your political battle, but you will have undermined democracy for a very long time to come. And that is something we should all reflect on. Thank you, Nicole. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I am uh, delighted to be speaking in this debate today, and I usually try to be reasonable uh, in debates, but today is actually not a day to be reasonable. With the Tory government on the ropes and on the brink of collapse, so why should anyone try and show any civility uh, to a Tory government who have got absolutely no sense of what it means to be reasonable? 
Why should any MSP in this chamber show any consideration uh, to our Tory UK government who have treated this parliament and also its politicians with contempt for the last two years? Yeah. It's, clear, it's clear that the Tories uh, just want to deliver uh, the Theresa May Brexit deal at any cost. And we've been told it's this deal or no deal. Now, this is not a game show. That's real life. And no matter which way any of us look at it, the deal on the table will only bring more pain, more suffering and more tragedy. Yesterday, we learned uh, that actually there is the potential for another way, stopping Brexit in its tracks. However, as the First Minister stated on Monday, she is working, a quote, she is working with others to build consensus around alternative proposals that would deliver on the vote of the people of Scotland to remain. But we have already heard about the economic disaster uh, that, uh, that, uh, that will happen if Brexit were to happen. And certainly, the, some of the figures uh, that have been published over the course of the last couple of weeks, if it's a no deal, a 7.3% hit to GDP uh, for, the, for an FTA, it's a 4.9% hit, or the EEA model, of a 1.4% hit to the GDP. Now, these are forecasts to hit the economy, but in real terms, my constituents and many others will suffer. And only last week, the Chancellor said on Radio 4, uh, if you look at this purely from uh, the economic point of view, there will be the cost to leaving the EU because there will be impediments to our trade. And then earlier on, uh, today, uh, this, the Attorney General device was published. And part of that, it states, in international law, the protocol would endure indefinitely. Now, that would actually make Northern Ireland more competitively superior as compared to Scotland. And then... Uh, last week, we also had the, the Scottish Government uh, paper was published, indicating that our GDP uh, will be £9 billion lower than if we stayed in the EU. That's the equivalent of £1,600 per person in, in Scotland. Yeah. John McAlpine. I'm very grateful to the member for taking an intervention uh, from me. Um, the member accompanied myself and Jamie Green with the European Committee uh, to uh, Brussels two weeks ago. And can he um, confirm that uh, the point that Jamie Green made earlier in the debate was incorrect when he said that the people we spoke to said that this was the only deal possible? What they also said was, as Mr Barney was quoted in, as saying the other day, it was the only deal possible given the red lines that Theresa May had set. <sighs> Stuart McMillan. No, I absolutely agree uh, with Joe McAlpine, and Joe McAlpine is correct in what she just said there on the record. Now, presenting officer, earlier on today, uh, we had the comments from Murdo Fraser and Liz Smith uh, highlighting and quoting uh, business interests uh, in this debate. I'm going to talk about people. Presenting officer, many of my constituents cannot take a £1,600 cut to their income. Many of them just would not survive. Here are just some of the effects of the Tories in power within the, within the current EU. Now, we have to remember, these are the results of policies, for, not from the EU Commission or unelected bureaucrats in Brussels, but actually from elected Tory MPs in Westminster. 200,000 children to be pulled into poverty by the two-child limit. 71,000 families have lost their entitlement to child allowance in tax credits or universal credit in the first year. 190 women have been forced to disclose that their child was a result of non-consensual conception. Couples with children will be £960 per year worse off. One-parent families will be £2,380 per year worse off. Families with two children will be £1,100 per year worse off. Families with three children will be £2,540 per year worse off. And then there's the introduction of the bedroom tax, which thankfully this SNP government managed to mitigate. There was also the EMA cuts. Uh, there was the EMA cut in England, but actually uh, that uh, wasn't, it didn't happen in Scotland because this SNP government actually mitigated, well, sorry, kept it. And then we come to the rollout of universal credit. This policy is nothing short of contentious for human life. Forcing people to wait five weeks, formerly six, to get money to live. It's all right for the members of the House of Lords turning up, clocking in, and then getting the £300 tax-free. Universal credit has been the largest welfare reform in a generation, but it's driving people into poverty at an alarming rate. And when universal credit is introduced in an area, there's an increase in demand in food banks. And 42% of people needed emergency food supplies are a, as a result of benefit delays and changes. And on average, 12 months after rollout, to after rollout, food banks see a 52% increase in demand. Now, presenting officer, the reason why, the reason why I'm highlighting these figures 
<laughs> the reason why I'm highlighting these figures is very simple. Because when Brexit happens, whether it's Theresa May's deal or whether it's any other deal, my constituents and the constituents of every single member in this chamber will have an adverse effect upon their lives. Presenting also, it's an utter disgrace and the Brexit will only make the situation worse. And when I see Tory MPs smiling for the camera, it's the handover food bank donations. I was nearly sick with disgust. It was political patronising of the worst kind and showed utter contempt for those who need to go to a food bank. How dare they? How dare they be so patronising about the less well-off? Uh, I've got so much respect for people who actually run the food banks as well as every volunteer. But it's a perverted political class that thinks poverty porn is something to smile at. Signing off, so Britain is broken and Brexit will shatter it forever. Now, I welcome independence, but I do not welcome the shattered and destroyed lives that are going to, to, going to take place and continue and increase with the rollout of universal credit. Now, that's the result of a heartless, uncaring and frankly out of touch and arrogant Prime Minister and her party. And the handling of Brexit has been a disaster from the start. And I've got absolutely no sympathy at all for the Prime Minister. She's brought this chaos on herself. And we'll betide any Tory MP at the next election, and also MSP at the next election, that defends, attempts to defend the indefensible to the electorate. Presiding officer, I absolutely, absolutely... Time, Mr McMillan. Absolutely appreciate there is a better alternative, and that's why I support this motion. Thank you very much. And Stuart Stevenson, and then we'll move to closing speeches. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, presiding officer, there was nothing unreasonable when fishermen voted to leave the common fisheries policy in 2016. When I came here in 2001, the EU was halving the number of Scottish fishing boats while simultaneously funding Spaniards with our money to expand their fleet. Um, we now see a rise in foreign vessels catches in our waters. A, a huge proportion, more than half. It's one of many reasons uh, to be out with the common fisheries policy. An arrangement, of course, that the SNP has opposed from the very outset mm -hmm. to the present day. Now, on the 17th of January 2017, uh, Theresa May spoke about her plan for Britain, addressing what she thought uh, should now happen after the referendum. It had a single mention of fishing, a mention of Spanish fishermen. No mentions of English fishermen, Irish fishermen, Welsh fishermen, or Scottish fishermen. Only a mention of Spanish fishermen tucked away right at the end, immediately before the conclusion of her speech. Now, this continues a line from the Tory sellout of fishermen on entry to the EC to today and to section 75 in the political declaration, uh, which reads, and I quote, within the context of the overall economic partnership, let me repeat that, within the context of the overall economic partnership, the parties should establish a new fisheries agreement on inter alia access to waters and quotas shares. So we know from that quote, encapsulated in section 75 of the political declaration that a fishing agreement is contingent on an economic partnership. There's a trade-off going to be made uh, against fishing rights. Optimists believe, against all the evidence so far, that UK Tories will abandon an economic partnership in favour of fishing or will show some miraculous uh, adoption of a negotiating strategy far superior than anything that we've seen to date. They simply don't encourage me, and if you track uh, what's been happening on social media, you will know that many fishermen are not buying it uh, either. Uh, presiding officer, um, the, 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 the history also gives us uh, much to say about, uh, about to what has happened. Mike Rumbles uh, quoted Edmund Burke and he did so appropriately. The Gettysburg Address in the Abraham Lincoln gave in 1863 uh, uh, made clear what happens when a country fights itself. The same is true when a political party fights itself as the Conservatives are now doing. It's not a war that can be won without casualties. It's probably not a war that can be won at all. 
Ross Greer talked about the dying days of a Tory government. I think he was wrong. We're actually facing something more serious. For democracy and for my many friends on the Conservative benches here and elsewhere, we're potentially witnessing the death of the Conservative Party. That is a party which went through huge trauma in 1846 uh, when Robert Peel uh, addressed the issues of the Corn Laws and the Tory party fissured. It took many decades, lives, before the Tory party came together. This time one cannot be certain in any way, shape or form that the Tory party will survive at all. And politics is diminished if we do not have a diversity of voices. And I think one of the losers in this whole sorry faragio is the democratic system itself. Now, let me just address the issue of why I think the Tories are dying as a party. Um, I have before me advice that's given to people who work in a hospice on how to recognize death. Someone who's dying usually begins to withdraw more and more into his own world. Sounds like the Tories. She or he is still conscious and able to communicate, but various behaviors may appear. Restlessness, disinterested in people or activities previously enjoyed. There is a decreased ability to grasp ideas. This sounds like the Tories. All the senses decline, even hearing. And if there's one sense the Tories are losing, it is an ability to hear what the public domain is saying, what the political domain is saying. And ultimately, we hear the death rattle of a party on its last legs, heading for the grave. If I'm allowed, I will. Yes, OK, Just, Mr. Reddy. Yeah, before he gets any more morose, um, can I bring him back to the present day? Um, how does he think we're going to get out of this situation? Does he think that a people's vote is gaining traction? Do you think it could happen? And do you think he'll really get behind this proposal so we can win it? Very briefly, Mr Stevenson. Um, we, we, we've had that subject already. For my part, I would prefer to see us have a relationship with the EU that that is of Norway. That's economically valuable, and it gets us out of the CFP. Presiding officer, I'm very obliged for the opportunity to speak. Fishing will remain a dominant issue for me, as for many of my constituents, and we will continue to hold the Tories to account. You can't trust them on fishing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. We'll move to closing speeches now. I call on James Kelly to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, presiding officer. As Mike Russell said at the beginning of this debate, it is indeed a, a unique circumstance when you have Labour, the SNP, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens uniting around the one motion to send a powerful signal tonight that this Parliament rejects the deal being put forward by Theresa May and also the prospect of a no deal. Uh, Adam Tompkins told us that the Theresa May deal was something that had been carefully negotiated. Well, if it's been carefully negotiated, then it's been carefully ne negotiated without good mind to the communities of Scotland and the communities of the United Kingdom. Because last week, when we listened to Philip Hammond, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, he told us that the impact of that deal was that the economy was going to be smaller. And what that means is that if you've got a smaller economy, then you're going to have less businesses, you're going to have less money generated in taxation and budgets are going to be reduced, including future Sc Scottish budgets. And that will do nothing for the 230,000 kids who are in poverty in Scotland. It will do nothing for the 470,000 people who have not been paid a real living wage. And for that and that reason alone, this deal should be rejected out of hand not, the, not just by this Parliament, but by the UK Parliament when it comes to be voted on next Tuesday. The other prospect being uh, put across by some Tory MPs is that uh, of a no deal. You know, and I think they really are living in a fantasy land and believing that in some way you can come to the 29th of March, you can leave the European Union and, you know, all the trading arrangements all the rules that support that infrastructure uh, will collapse and it will have no economic in impact. Because as the Bank of England told us, 
Uh, that could result in an 8% reduction in economic growth and the loss of 100,000 jobs. So that would be an absolute catastrophe. Both of these uh, options that the Tory party and their different wings are putting across uh, would have no prospect of helping the people of this country. And I think Ross Greer was right when he said, when he pointed out that the, the crisis that we face is one that has been created uh, by the Tory party themselves. I mean, it's been a long afternoon across there on the Conservative Party benches. There's been a lot of work done on the laptops, the, the phones uh, and the tablets as people look down for distractions away from the, the real criticisms that have been made. Real criticism made from the, 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 the crisis that you've created. And there's no doubt it's been driven by uh, trying to deal with the internal problems in the Tory party. When you go back to before 2016, David Cameron brought the referendum forward in order to try and placate those on the right wing of the party. And that, was, that disastrous referendum and the outcome are what we are uh, living with now. And during the course of the last two and a half years, Theresa May has been focused purely on trying to get a deal that brings the Tory party together. And you saw how that had completely failed last night in the House of Commons, when in the space of 63 minutes, the government lost three votes with the opposition parties uh, uniting against the deal. And we heard much. Sure. I'm grateful to Mr Kelly for giving way. He's talked a lot about what the Conservatives are doing. When is he or somebody else on the Labour benches going to tell us what exactly is the Labour position on Brexit? James Kelly. What the, what the Labour Party want, what the people of this country want, is they want, is they want the Tory party and Theresa May out of Downing Street. And we want... We will stand against a government who have piled agony onto the communities of Scotland and the United Kingdom. We want a government that will stop the cuts, that will lift people, lift people out of poverty and that will grow the economy. And you won't get that from the Tory party. We heard much, we heard much from the Tory party of the red lines, David Mundell and Ruth Davidson, how they would resign if there was any threat to the union. And when we saw the backstop being created and the legal advice that's been published uh, by, the, the law, by the Advocate General, you see the, the impact of those red lines. The Tory red lines have disappeared, they've melted like chocolate Santas in front of the Christmas fire. Totally ineffectual. That's the impact of the Tory party. Absolutely. The reality is, that Theresa May's deal is dead in the water. It's time up for the, it's time up for the Tories. It's time for the general election. And it's time for a different approach that will lift the United Kingdom and Scotland out of this crisis. Thank you, Anna Colin. Murder Fraser to be followed by the Cabinet Secretary. Murder Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Well, this debate... Uh, was called by the Scottish Government in an attempt to demonstrate that there is a view across this Parliament on the EU withdrawal agreement. And they have managed to form an unholy alliance with the Greens and the Liberal Democrats and Labour in opposition to the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement. But what has been revealed in this debate is that these parties have absolutely nothing in common when it comes to proposing an alternative to what the Prime Minister is suggesting. They might not like what is on offer, but we are utterly unclear what they think should be done instead. The motion in the name of Mr Russell refers to a better alternative being taken forward. We've no idea what that better alternative is because there is no consensus amongst these parties as to what it should be. But let me try and uh, understand if I can. Um, not at the moment, Mr Finlay. Let me try and understand from the various parties what we've learnt about what their positions are on the withdrawal agreement. And let's start, because I'm feeling generous, with the Liberal Democrats. Tavish Scott told us they support a people's vote. Now, taking the view that if there is a referendum held where they don't like the result, 
we should just rerun it until they get the result that they want. That doesn't sound either liberal or democratic, yeah. presiding officer. And Liz Smith, in her contribution, made a very uh, important point. It is very dangerous for democracy if the political establishment decide the people have made the wrong decision in a referendum, we're then going to rerun that referendum until we get the right result. That is going to undermine democracy, not just now. And we are absolutely no clearer on what this people's vote would involve, because there are at least four options now on the table. There's the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement, there's a no-deal Brexit, there's some other deal, or cancelling Brexit altogether. How you can run a referendum, well, here, here, says Mr. Rumbles, how you can run a referendum with four different options on the ballot paper and try and get a clear result is utterly beyond me. But rather than answer those serious questions, the pseudo-unionists and the Liberal Democrats would rather ally themselves with the SNP in an exercise in constitutional grandstanding. Shame on them, presiding officer. Well, thank you. Oh, of course. Mr. Will there any? It's another case then when it comes to constitutional chaos. The Conservatives don't need help from anybody at all. They, the mem just, did the member see this? Did the member see this morning? <laughs> that enough? Ah, see? Go on. <laughs> Murder Fraser. Mr. Rennie can ally himself with the SNP if he wants. We'll be taking no lessons from him on supporting the United Kingdom. But let me turn uh, to uh, Labour, who equally are happy to help with, as, act as Nicola Sturgeon's little helpers. And yet, we have absolutely no clarity on what the Labour position is. I listened to Neil Finlay, to Rhoda Grant, to Polly McNeill, to James Kelly. Not a single one could tell us what the Labour stance on Brexit is. I will give way to Mr Finlay if he will tell us what is the Labour Party stance on Brexit, because neither he or any of his colleagues could tell us in the course of this debate. Absolutely. Neil we would renegotiate on the basis of permanent customs union, yes. single market access, rights respected. We would have equivalent EU programmes and agencies, maintain security and cooperation, no hard border in Ireland and a fair immigration system. Is that enough for you, Mr and Fraser? Murder Fraser. And the European Union 27 have made it clear they would have no truck with a deal such as that. Why can't you listen to what the EU27 are saying? No, they would rather stir up grievance politics against the Conservative government rather than get forward to do anything positive for the future of the United Kingdom. But let's turn, if we can, to the SNP, whose entire approach to this has been driven by political opportunism, personified in the Constitution Secretary himself. And he's been all over the place in the last two weeks in terms of the SNP position on this. He denounced the Prime Minister's deal before he had even a chance to read it. Within 23 minutes of the withdrawal agreement's publication, Michael Russell was telling us what a bad deal it was. Twelve days ago, he was tweeting about how the withdrawal bill was a betrayal of Scotland's fishermen. And yet at that very point, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation were making clear they had a different view. And they said, and this is a quote, a quote from them, the facts are these. Under the Brexit deal as it stands, we will be out of the CFP. We will become an independent coastal state. But Mr. Russell thinks he knows more about Scottish fishing than the Scottish fishermen themselves. And it doesn't stop there. No, I need to make some progress. It doesn't stop there. Because he was also denouncing the withdrawal agreement as a betrayal of the people of Gibraltar, tweeting lines about Gibraltar at exactly the same point as the first minister of Gibraltar, Fabian Picardo was putting out a statement welcoming the Prime Minister's defence of that territory. But this Constitution Secretary thinks he knows better what's in the interest of the people of Gibraltar than the elected First Minister of Gibraltar. Presiding officer, the fact is that the SNP stance is all about stirring up constitutional grievance and trying to shift public opinion towards a second independence referendum and shame on the Liberal Democrats and shame on Labour for standing with them. Now, presiding officer, we will no doubt hear, we will no doubt hear after the uh, debate uh, tonight, and there's a vote as we expect it to go, we'll hear from those in the SNP and the other benches how the UK government should respect the result of the vote in this parliament. That's a bit rich coming from a party and government that doesn't itself respect the votes of this parliament, as we've seen on primary one testing and a whole range of other issues. But I think when it comes to the vote tonight, there is a clear choice to be made, both here and in the House of Commons next week. We can listen to all those calling for support for this withdrawal agreement. 
Listen to the Scottish Chambers of Commerce. Listen to the CBI in Scotland. Listen to leading business figures like Sir Ian Wood. Listen to the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, the National Farmers Union of Scotland, and the Scotch Whiskey Association, and back the Prime Minister. Or we can take our lead from the SNP and vote it down, leading us towards a no-deal Brexit with the catastrophe that might well turn out to be. Because, let us be clear, that is the consequence of voting down this deal. That is why industry and business are so concerned about what happens if this deal is lost. And that is what the SNP are leading us to, backed up by other parties in this chamber. Presiding officer, if we do end up with a no-deal Brexit, it will be entirely clear to the people of Scotland who is to blame for that. And it won't be those who tried to find a solution in our party. It will be those on the Labour benches, on the Liberal Democrat benches, on the SNP benches. They will be the ones who have voted us down the route of a no-deal Brexit. And we will take every opportunity between now and 2021 to remind the voters of Scotland who delivered that to them. Thank you. And to conclude our debate, Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I noted during the debate that, that Philip Sim of the BBC had noted that this is a unique event, not just because there's a motion supported by four parties, but because four parliaments will be considering this matter. Three simultaneously, the House of Commons, House of Lords and ourselves are doing it today, and last night the uh, Welsh Assembly did so. And you can take that point a, a little further and reflect upon that, that I think it's pretty certain. We know what the outcome was in Wales last night. It was to refuse both the idea of the Prime Minister's deal and the no deal. I don't want to uh, count chickens, but I suspect that the same thing will happen here tonight. Uh, we know the House of Lords will reject this deal, and it is likely the House of Commons will. So I would say to the Tories, uh, apparently, according to Mur Murdo Fraser, uh, we don't respect the result of this Parliament. I think the Tories should respect the result of four parliaments and think very carefully again. Let me, um, let me however, indicate what desperate times these are. Uh, I, I noticed that Willie Rennie, uh, in agreeing with Jenny, Jenny Gilruth, made the point that they must be exceptionally desperate to bring two people together across the kingdom of Fife. I, I, they're even more desperate than that because I am about to quote with enormous approval and at some length, uh, Mike Rumbles, something I have <laughs> never, ever done in here before, and I never expect to do so again. I know, and I am, I am almost as embarrassed about that as Mike Rumbles appears to be. Mike Rumbles uh, referred to uh, the Edmund Burke's address to the electors of Bristol of 1774, and I happen to carry around a quotation from that with me all the time. Edmund Burke, of course, was, as indeed you do, indeed, as Mr. Sweeney knows, that's the type of thing I would do. Um, and, of course, Edmund Burke was the founder of modern conservatism, as well as the founder, essentially, or very in greatly influenced the development of political parties. And, indeed, the, um, I have to say that the uh, work that, uh, the primary work on him in recent times has been done by a Tory minister, Jesse Norman's book on Edmund Burke's thought, I would commend to the Tories. And I'd commend the issue uh, particularly in the quote that Mr. Rumbles used. And I'm going to use the quote in its entirety because it gives a complete lie to the argument that the Tories have used this afternoon. And in particular, it utterly, it utterly contradicts the point that uh, uh, both Donald Cameron and Liz Smith made, who I, I, I admire both of them. But it actually completely contradicts. And this is what it says. It ought to be the happiness and glory of a representative to live in the strictest union, the closest correspondence, and the most unreserved communication with his constituents. It is duty to sacrifice his repose, his pleasures to theirs, and above all, ever and in all cases, to prefer their own interests to his own. But his unbiased opinion, his mature judgment, his enlightened conscience, he ought not to sacrifice to you, to any man, or to any set of men living. These he does not obtain from your pleasure, nor from the law and the constitution. There are trust from providence for the abuse of which he is deeply answerable. And this is the key line. Your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment. And he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. In one moment, please. That is the key issue. You cannot argue in this chamber that you were told what to do by the electors and your judgment has nothing to do with it. You are elected to bring that judgment to bear. Mr Cameron and Ms Smith should know that. It's regrettable they don't. Liz Smith. 
Would the Cabinet Secretary accept that when parliamentarians in Westminster and Holyrood, any other chamber, take a decision to have a referendum, then we have to listen to the people? Is he really arguing that we shouldn't be doing that? Cabinet Secretary. I am arguing, I am arguing in the words of Edmund Burke that it is the judgment of politicians that also counts. Both Daryl Cameron and Liz Smith indicated that their judgment was that Brexit was wrong. They, that was their judgment. But they have subordinated their judgment to that issue. That strikes me as, at best, an excuse. Let me now let me just turn to some of the other contributions within this debate. And I want to talk about, of course, Patrick Harvey to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. It seems to me that the Conservative contributions have been more interested in the politics than in even trying to persuade us that the contents of this agreement and political declaration have any merit. Given that so many of them found it hilarious that anyone would raise an issue so trivial as climate change, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us, has the UK government given him any indication of how their supposed UK emissions trading scheme will work, when it will be set up? how it will be connected to the UK scheme, or why we should trust the government that has already pulled the rug from under the renewables industry to make these decisions in the first place. Uh, the the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary, Secretary advises me that the, the best we can hope for is there might be a meeting in the new year. So the answer is we have not been given that indication. Now, I, I haven't got the time, presiding officer, to go through all of the contributions, but it is important in the light of what Patrick Harvey has just said to remember that the primary contribution of the Tory benches today was that we must just make the best of a bad job. There's not much we can do about this. We might as well just get on with it. So let's make the best of a bad job. There are people sitting on the Tory benches who are in favour of leaving. They have an honourable position, but it's now all reduced to the fact that this is a complete burach. It is, in actual fact, to, to use a word coined by my uh, friend Hugh Dan McLennan, a cluster burach. But what has happened is that we're just going to abandon our principles, hold our noses and vote for it. That is no, con that is no recommendation for any action to be taken. And for a party of government to make that recommendation, it shows they are unfit for government. Let me conclude, presiding officer, with two contributions I want to disagree with. As I've said, I, I, I have some time for Donald Cameron, but he was wrong in his definition of fr what freedom of movement actually was. He defended the citizens' rights provisions within this, and he compared them to freedom of movement. Now, I made the point in my opening speech that the removal of freedom of movement will cause absolute economic mayhem within Argyll and Butte, within the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. There is no doubt about that, that m almost all the sectors will suffer huge dislocation because there simply are no replacement workers available. That is the fact. The Prime Minister in Argentina said it was a job of companies to train up homegrown workforce. There is no homegrown workforce that is available. So if he is seriously supporting the end of freedom of movement, he is inevitably meaning inevitably condemning the area he represents, the area that he has contested against me to represent, to economic decline. There is no if and no but about that. And finally, presiding officer, I want to turn to the contribution from Adam Tompkins. I did agree, in actual fact, with Tavish Scott that uh, the discomfort that Mr Tompkins showed, I think, betrayed the fact that he doesn't believe a word of this. Not a single word. He knows how harmful this is. He knows that this is a disaster for Scotland. And to come to this chamber and argue for it, I have to say, is regrettable. And I hope he will, in time, have the opportunity to regret it. But let me make this point about it. You have to look at his contribution and say, what is the track record of being involved in these issues? What is the track record in terms of the advice that he has given people about the issue of the EU and Scotland? And you could judge then what the veracity and the strength of his recommendations on that track record. And I can do no better than quote from a blog he wrote in, uh, in August the 29th, 2014. A blog entitled, Would an Independent Scotland Remain in the EU? And at the end of that blog, he, these are his words. But there is little real danger of the UK leaving the EU. <laughs> Any yes campaigner arguing in 2014 that the only way of securing Scotland's membership of the EU is to vote yes, is scaremongering, plain and simple. Now there's the track record of contribution. There's a man who said it would not happen, and then said those people who said it would happen, who knew it was a false argument, were simply to be dismissed. How could you trust that? 
So the reality of the situation is this. We have a motion from four parties in front of us. It is a motion that I think speaks for Scotland. I ask every member to support it. That concludes our debate on the EU withdrawal agreement. We're going to move to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 15045 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Thank you very much. Uh, no one appears to wish to speak against the motion or on the motion. The question is that motion 15045 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of business motions 15406 and 15407 on stage one timetables for two bills. Uh, could I call on Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau to move the motions? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you. And no one appears to wish to speak against the motions. The question is therefore that motions 15406 and 15407 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 15048 on approval of an SSI. Could I ask Graeme Day to move this motion? Moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. We turn now to decision time. There are two questions today. The first question is that Motion 15032, in the name of Michael Russell, on protecting our interests, Scotland's response to the UK Government and EU's withdrawal agreement and political declaration be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may press their vote buttons now. The result of the vote on motion 15032 in the name of Michael Russell is yes, 92, no, 29. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. <laughs> and our final question is that motion 15048 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We're going to move now to members' business in the name of Alison Johnson on remembering conscientious objectors. But we'll just take a few moments for the members, the minister and the public gallery to change seats. <laughs>